Hello everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 11, we're going to roll the 6L6 power tube. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, on with the show. Oh, and if you watch till the end, I'll give you a Black Friday discount code. Okay, the 6L6 is a beam-powered tetrode, which means four parts. Cathode, control grid, screen grid, and anode. It was first introduced by RCA in 1936, but only under license. The design work was done by the Brits under the EMI subsidiary Marconi Ostrom LTD. Numerous versions of this power tube were developed, starting with the 6L6, which was a metal tube rated at 19 watts, and ending with the 6L6 GC rated for 30 watts. In episode number 10, we talked about the importance of checking the data sheet of your vintage tube before plugging it into a modern amp. Failure to do so could destroy a beautiful tube and piss you off for a seriously long time. Up until now, we've talked about small signal tubes like the 12AU7, 12AX7, and 6SN7. All of these tubes are triodes and primarily low current voltage amplifiers. In the case of the 12AX7, with an MU or gain of 100, you put in 1 millivolt and you get out approximately 100 millivolts. Power tubes are, com are a completely different beast. They are designed to push current through the output transformer to your speakers. The minute you increase the current, you increase the heat. And so you end up with a much larger plate and tube structure in order to dissipate the heat. Let's take a quick look at this Russian version of the 6L6. Look at the size of that plate structure. Large wings to dissipate heat and some big slots to allow for ventilation. Now, here's my take on the sound of power tubes versus small preamp tubes like the 12AX7 and 6SN7. In my opinion, preamp tubes have a larger influence on overall sound compared to the output tubes. The reason for this is the signal amplification is done by the preamp tubes. The power tubes are just taking that signal and driving it through the output transformer. Does this mean power tubes have no say in the overall sound signature? Not at all. They still have a significant role to play in the overall sound. However, the most important component in a power amplifier is actually the output transformer. And that is why the big boys spend so much money on them. Okay, enough rambling. Y'all just want to know what are the best tubes. So let's take a look at a bunch. All of these tubes are low noise and low microphonics. Okay, starting first with my number 120, the original RCA 6L6 in a metal can. Neat, huh? First off, this tube uses pin number one to connect the metal case to ground. If you're using these tubes for the first time in your amp, have a quick look and make sure pin one is vacant. It should be, but some amp builders will use what is normally a vacant connection in a 6L6 socket as a tag strip. You don't want to discover that your case of your metal tube is running at 350 plus volts. Now do you? Let's take a quick look at this tube. Have a little six RCA label on it. Made in the USA. Little manufacturing code. 
not a lot to them. Some of these will get a little spotty and rusty over the years. You can see a little bit of primer through. It really is just a cosmetic issue. Um, and let's have a look at pin one. So this is an octal tube, so it's got eight pins on it, but you don't always get eight pins. If the circuit doesn't need eight, you won't necessarily get them all, or you may get a tube in the spot you don't need it. So in this case, you can see, let's locate that. So here's, here's the keyway right here. Pin one's right here beside it. That makes this pin eight. So this is one, two, all the way around. And so you can see three, four, five. So pin six is missing. You don't need pin six in a 6L6 circuit. Um, and let's just plug it in. So when you're looking at pin one, it's always taken as though you're the builder of the amp. So it's not from the top. It's always from the bottom. So here's... Um, an octal socket. I actually carry these in the store. I like them a lot. They're sturdy and very affordable. And I've never had a problem with them. So there we go. That's what it would look like if you looked upside down at your amp. There's, there's the keyway. And there's a one right here. Now, without knowing that the keyway tells you that this is pin one right here, you wouldn't know if this is one or this is one. Now we know this is one, so two is over here, that's going to be here, and so on all the way around. So this this is the connection that should be vacant, or um, if you were building a custom amp just for metal tubes, you would take this and you would wire it to ground. Okay. But how did they sound? Well, surprisingly good. Bass had nice tone with a bit of punch. Mid-range through treble had nice tone and a neutral sound with a nice sound stage. At first, I was meh. Then I realized that these tubes don't have a lot of coloration, a very neutral and clean sound. In the end, I like them. I wonder if the metal case acts to dampen microphonics. It must. Maybe someone out there will have some thoughts on this and let us know in the comments section. Oh, and before I forget, all metal case tubes get very, very hot. Fry an egg hot. So always let them cool down or use a cotton rag to remove them. And don't ask me how I learned this. Next up is my number 164 GE 6L6 GC, rebranded for Baldwin Organ. Let's have a quick look at it. So we've got a fairly large oval rectangular plate structure with large wings with the rivets. Let's see if we can get it close so you can see those rivets. There you go. It's got dual large D side getters, which is something that GE use quite quite often. And if we didn't have any indicators on this too, we actually have a manufacturing code here. But if we didn't have that, if it had rubbed off, let's see if you can see the dots. There's some dots here. Only, as far as I know, only GE use that as a manufacturing code. So that would tell us it's a G. And of course, you have chrome on the sides. On the top, above the mica, we've got a U-shaped shield, and that sits right on top of the very top of the heater, and that'll glow nice and bright. And here, you can see that actually pin 1 is vacant and pin 6. So you only need 6 pins to make this circuit function. 2 for the heater, 4 for the circuit. But how did it sound? Bass had nice tone and was slightly forward. Mid-range was clear, very detailed and slightly forward. Trebled was, was detailed with nice attack and finish. Overall, a nice vintage tube. It does a good job in every way. These I didn't want to roll out. Next is my number 176, Reflector 
6P, 3S, or in Russian, 6N, 3C. A tube that is a unique Russian design that can work well as a 6L6 substitute. Note, I'm not calling this an equivalent or a near equivalent. I have successfully used them in Class A with a bit over 300 volts on the plate with cathode bias. One data sheet and some authorities on the net say they can handle a lot more. And some say less. So be cautious. Let's take a look at them. So you have about a medium sized plate with good sized wings, lots of rivets on them. Waist chrome, that means it's got a bottom getter and you can see a very typical um, circular plate like uh, getter and that is typically called a flying saucer and that is unique to Russian tubes. In fact, that's a good hint. If, you, um, if you're looking at a tube that says that it's uh, some valuable um, Western made tube uh, and you're suspicious of it and it's got that flying saucer, it may very well be a faked Russian tube. And a uh, big shout out to Tube Maze who turned me on to that. It's something I should have noticed because I, I buy a lot of Russian tubes and I use a lot of Russian tubes. I sell a lot of Russian tubes, but uh, it's just not something I ever noticed. So, thanks Tube Maze. So, we've got two micas as spacers here, otherwise known as ears. And again, we've got a top shield. But how did they sound? Well, bass had a very nice tone and detailed. It was also neutral. Mid-range had good detail and clarity and was neutral. Treble was detailed and neutral. Overall, a nice tube with good detail and neutral across the spectrum. A very different sound from the rest of the 6L6s. If you like your tube sound to be very warm, this is not the tube for you. On the other hand, if you prefer a more detailed, clear presentation, this may be your tube. My test tubes put out a lovely bit of blue glow, visible even in a lit room. Given how inexpensive they are, I'm going to award this a Best Buy for some people. Next is my number 160 reflector 6P3S-E. Remember, this is just a straight 6P3S. And this is the earlier version of this tube. Or shall we say, this is an older Russian tube that is compatible. And in Russian, that's 6N3C-E. It's a close equivalent to the 6L6GC. And note, the Sovtech 6L6WGC is the current production version of this tube. Sovtech is just the Western brand name used by Reflector. Let's take a quick look at them. So there's your symbol for a Reflector. These are dated in 1979 in the first week. They have a really large plate structure. We looked at that earlier with good rivets, fairly large wings as well to help dissipate heat. They have a modern coin base, which I like quite a bit. Uh, I've never had a problem with them, and they look, I think they look neat in the app. And typical of these tubes, uh, they have double flying saucer top getters. Kind of neat, eh? And of course, a chrome dome. But how did they sound? Bass had nice tone and punch, but a little muddy. Mid-range was crisp and clear with some richness and the treble was crisp with a nice fast attack and slow decay. Overall, a nice sounding quality Russian tube with a very nice top end. I use these every day in my monoblocks and have never had a failure. They're very reliable. I'm going to also award these a Best Buy given how inexpensive they are. Next is a variant called the 5881. 
or in this case Tungsol also designated it as the mil-spec Jan CTL 6L6 WGB. Now that's a mouthful. Okay, let's have a quick look at it. So you can see we've got a fairly short tube body, but a very stuff in there, a very large plate structure with smaller side wings, but let's see if you can see it's got a reinforcing rod that runs all the way up this thing. Remember, this is a mil spec tube, and look at the ears on this thing, the mica spacers. There's six of them. So this plate structure is really well anchored in there. There's your 5881. Sometimes this is all that will be printed on there, and I suspect, I've spent some time researching this, but I suspect that this mil spec and the 5881, they're identical tubes. And normally the 5881's on the top, but they that often rubs off. A lot of people like their chrome domes to be nice and shiny, and they wipe that off in a few seconds. But how did these tongue saws sound? Well, base was detailed and a bit forward. Mid-range was clear and neutral. Treble was very nice and detailed. This tube had the best base of the field, even basting the Coke bottles slightly. This tube does everything well with an edge in the base department. These good results aren't surprising. Vintage Tungsol power tubes are highly sought after for their rugged build and quality sound. One of the more expensive 6L6 variants, but worth it in my opinion. I'm going to award this the best overall. Last, but definitely not least, is my number 163 GE slash Philco Jan 6L6G, an early glass version of the 6L6 in the easily recognized Coke bottle shape. Let's have a quick look at them. So there you can see it says General Electric on it. The other identical tube says Philco on it, made in Canada, Jan 6L6G. G just stands for glass. This is the first glass version. Maybe not the first run of the 6L6Gs, but it, it's it's certainly in that family. You can see that it's got a medium, light to medium smoke um, glass, and that is to reduce electrical interference. Normally the smoking's not done on top, so you can see it's got a clear dome. Hope you can see it's got a huge D getter down here, which means it's got waste chrome. The plate is a oval rectangular plate with uh, small wings elevated right to the top of the tube. This is quite common in early uh, vintage tubes to elevate the plate structure. And it has the same top shield as we've talked about before. But how did these gorgeous tubes sound? Well, base was natural and detailed. Mid-range was a bit forward with nice punch. Treble was detailed with nice attack. And these beauties glow bright. In fact, my YouTube picture for Tube Lab is a close-up of one of these. Overall, these are wonderful tubes. Not that many are left, and finding reasonably matched pairs is only going to get harder. When I listen to this tube, it reminds me of my first Canadian press of Miles Davis's Round About Midnight, recorded from October 1955 to September 1956 on all tube gear. In only a few short years, he would record one of the greatest jazz records of all time. You guessed it, Kind of Blue. Okay, now everyone knows I'm a jazz fan. So we've got a few other tubes sitting around here. Let's start with this one. This one says Tungsol, 5881. Now, I recently bought um, a batch of 5881s from my tube wholesaler, and this was in the batch. It was supposed to be a vintage tube, but clearly it's not. Is this a fake? 5881. No, 
It's not. It's clearly marked made in Russia, so it is a reissue. And they've made a really good attempt to build it similarly. Not the same. You can tell right away the mic is different. The slot at the bottom here is is on the new reissue and not on the uh, original. And I have quite a few of the 5880, original 5881s. The color of the brown is wrong. It's not normally even this dark, actually. It's usually a little lighter and often a little deteriorated, but it's certainly not that color. So, and, and they went to the trouble of putting the 5881 on the top. Very nice. Um, and I would have reviewed these, but he only put one in. And of course, to do a proper review in stereo, I need a pair. So maybe in a future tube lab, we'll include these so we can compare them to the original. Okay, before I go, a fun story. In tube lab number 10, one of the featured tubes was the Sylvania 6SN7 GT, also known as a bad boy. And here's one right here. Now, not surprisingly, they sold right away and are on their way to a good home in Norway. So I had to find something like it to roll in for special listening sessions. And no, I don't play 70-year-old tubes all the time. And that reminds me, when you have antique tubes that are rare, precious, and expensive, maybe keep them for special occasions like the holidays coming up. Then roll back in something that is reliable, sounds good, and replaceable for your everyday listening. That's what I do anyways. So, I started digging, looking for another one of these. And I couldn't find anything. So I started listening to pairs of various Sylvanias and other makes. And I worked my way all the way to the bottom of the bin. And wouldn't you know it, at the very bottom of the bin, there was a rebranded Sylvania tube by Rogers. Let's see if you can see that. And it's got the waste chrome, it's got the identical two rivets on each pl black plate, elevated plates. It's missing its manufacturing code, it's got its label, and it's an ex identical tube. In fact, I've done some listening tests and it's, they sound great. And here's the amazing thing the sections are matched, so I have a matched pair. Sometimes life is good. Okay. If you enjoyed this YouTube, please hit the like button and subscribe. And if you stay till the end, here is a Black Friday 2020 discount code. It's good for 15% off the entire store, excluding the discount tubes, and it expires at midnight, Monday, November 30th. Well, that was fun. This is Jim from Valsenmore, signing off.